So we're introducing this, the, the new sub panel. Um, and um, I wanted to introduce Joanne Hewitt, who's head of HEPAP, to talk about the, how this started. And then we'll give a, a very short introduction. And our point today is to actually get your input. So we'd like to hear from you today. There's a Google Doc that's linked to the Indigo site. So if you, if you want to add something after the fact or during the meeting or ask a question, um, you can do it that here, or we'll, we'll try to take some notes about um, your, your input during the meeting. And um, let's start with Joanne to give you some background of what, what this panel is about. I, uh, thanks everybody for coming here to be with us during your lunch hour. It's very much appreciated and your input is very important. Um, so this started actually with basic energy sciences program within the Department of Energy Office of Science. Uh, their advisory panel called BSAC uh, started what they called a benchmarking exercise. I think it started in 2020 and, and it lasted about a year or a year and a half. It lasted for a long time. And they had a very competitive outlook in terms of the United States should be the best and we need bigger and better light sources in, in the US. That was their conclusion. Um, and then it, um, the thought started that other programs within the Office of Science should also take a look uh, just as to benchmark how our programs stand here in the US compared to, to the rest of the world. Uh, in high energy physics, as we know, we're a bit different. Uh, we work, we collaborate with our international partners. This is the first line in the 2014 P5 report is that US particle physics is a global enterprise. And so instead of taking the tact of how can we compete uh, to have the best and the greatest facilities, all of them here in the US, uh, we're taking the tact with this panel of what makes the US a partner of choice. So what makes international researchers want to come to the US to do high energy physics? And what makes us want to participate in research facilities across the globe? So there's three charges and, and Patty and Bonnie who have so delightfully agreed to co-chair this panel. And I wanna give my sincere thanks to both of them. Uh, so it's been a lot of time and effort already and we'll continue. <laughs> Um, they, they will say more about the, the three charge points, but I just want to give a very global introduction. Uh, the first one is really just what I just said. What makes the U.S. a partner of choice in this global enterprise of high energy physics? Uh, the second is what key areas does the U.S. lead or aspire to lead? Uh, to, to, to be a, a leader, you have to have at least one area of the field in which you're leading. And what does it take to do that? And then the third one, of course, is very important, is talent and workforce. And how can we attract and retain the most talented workforce? And so with that, I'll hand off back to Patty and Bonnie. So um, we have um, just a very short introduction. As we said, what we're here today is to get your feedback and your input into the committee where most of us are here through the rest of, of the snowmass time. So if you um, think of something afterwards, you can always talk to us later, or as I said, enter into the Google uh, doc that is linked to the Indigo agenda. So this is the, um, the, the, the sub-panel we've just gotten started. You can see the, the list of members. Many of them are here on the stage. Um, and some are actually with us on Zoom uh, because it's a, it's a weekend of few, few members of the panel were not able to join us today. Um, oops. So here it is. You can actually read it in this form of, of the who's, who's on the panel and, um, and the co-chair. So let me hand off to Bonnie. How do I change the slide? Sorry, how do I change the slide? Okay, that's the wrong way. So um, thank you all for coming. We look forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, Joanne talked uh, a bit about some of these charge questions and I won't belabor them. You can find the charge online uh, and uh, the key points are in the three charge questions here though. How can we maintain critical international collaboration how can we sustain our leading roles to attract the best international partners? 
And how can we build and maintain our reputation in other areas and be a partner of choice? Uh, I really don't know how to do this. Show me how you did that. Okay, good. The second charge question. Okay. It's thinking more about our uh, world leading capabilities. What can we bring to international collaboration, both in US based uh, experiments and abroad? Uh, and um, how do we take advantage of the, the resources that we have and apply them uh, in the most effective way possible? And are there you know, other uh, technical resources and capabilities that we can leverage or grow uh, towards, our, uh, towards addressing scientific questions in an international concept? Let me the next couple. And then how can the programs and facilities be structured to attack and re, re, attract and retain talent, talented people? What are the barriers to successfully advancing careers of scientific and technical personnel in particle physics and related fields? And how can US funding agencies address these barriers? A complete answer to these questions must address how we can ensure that we are recruiting, training, mentoring, and retaining the best talent from all over the world including uh, among traditionally underrepresented groups within the US. So that's a, that's a, a, it's a longer version of what Joanne said is the three charge questions. And um, it's, it, it's important that we explain how the field works and how we can, how, where it's successful and where we can do better and where we must do better. So um, today we thought we would, um, since we have a lot of the, the panel members here to get your input, um, we would hear briefly, we've, we're organized with um, four different subcommittees uh, that we would hear today from the um, subcommittee chairs about the things that they've been thinking about, some of the questions that are on their mind and, and they'd like to get your feedback on this. So. Um, the, the four areas that we're, we've divided ourselves is how do the big experiments work with the big collaborations with, with, um, with uh, established governance? How do the smaller collaborations work, smaller experiments, R&D projects, um, quantum, um, AI, AIML collaborations? How does that work internationally? And, and theory is sort of woven into both of these areas. And then to talk about the accelerator program and how the accelerator facility Accelerator R&D works internationally. And then a, a fourth panel, we're talking about workforce. So we have the chairs of the committees here, either in the room or online. And I'm gonna ask to, to start, we'll start with talking about um, the, the experiments and how these things, how we work together internationally, how we compete across international boundaries. And I'd, I'd call on Andy and then Ian to start to, to introduce the, um, their questions. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the big experiment subcommittee before I hand off to Ian to talk about the small experiment subcommittee. Okay. Okay. So um, the, the big experiment subcommittee is investigating these charge points that we just went over in the context of the very large experimental collaborations. So an example uh, or a couple examples are Atlas and CMS, which I think are generally viewed as a successful examples. Uh, there are also an example of uh, international collaborations that are hosted abroad. Another example would be the Dune experiment, which of course is an example of an international experiment hosted here in the US. We, we want to examine both of the, that, those cases. So the approach we're taking is to start by interviewing uh, leaders of these uh, experiments and collaborations, uh, both US leaders and international leaders in both cases. We've got a long list of experiments. Uh, we're focused mainly on current experiments, uh, but not entirely. For instance, we plan to talk to um, leaders from Daya Bay and Babar, just as a couple of examples of experiments now completed. We we're also, of course, looking at experiments from all three experimental frontiers, cosmic intensity and energy. But of course, um, we do business a little bit differently. 
uh, research is a little bit different on the different frontiers. So we'll need to take into account those differences as well in our study. So just as a sample of what we're trying to learn, um, here are a couple sample questions. And these sample questions that we are asking leaders of experiments, these sample questions, there'd be interesting also to have uh, your feedback on. So for instance, first question is, are there certain areas of technical or physics expertise that make US scientists and engineers attractive partners for initiatives hosted elsewhere in the world? So it's both could be te technical expertise on you know, some particular part of an experiment or an accelerator, uh, but also the physics expertise. And again, we want to, uh, you know, we'll, we ask, you know, the question one way for experiments hosted elsewhere and one way for hosted in the US. Uh, another question that we ask is, are there barriers that impede US ability to form major international partnerships? or the compromise US ability to partner on international experiments hosted abroad. So, say, so we're, gonna, we're gonna welcome your uh, input on questions like, like this. And here I wanna hand off to uh, Ian. Thank you, Andy. So to define small experiments, we simply look at what he's defined as a large experiment and do the others. So in that sense, it's very similar to what Andy said, however, we're not limited in my subcommittee, just to small experiments. We've been asked also to look at some broader uh, things that come and cut across some of the experiments. And one of those is instrumentation. Another one is quantum. And another one is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And so for the part that is concerned with smaller versions of the large experiments and is covered, for example, Xenon, and for example, LZ. These are examples of very successful, exciting experiments, one older than the other. One have been through many upgrades, the other totally transformed by its latest upgrade, one international based in the US, one international based in the Grand Sasser. And of course, they have a very exciting future, uh, merging into one much larger experiment in the future. And so we'll be asking the leaders of those experiments, both US and international, the same questions that Andy laid out and others, including ones that Andy will also ask, which are about the attraction for international people in coming here in the US to do an experiment and also the complications in doing so. And asking both sides of that equation, the answer to that question. When it comes to things like instrumentation more broadly in terms of it, it's different because there we're dealing with, for example, the instrumentation community, which has an identity in Europe and has an identity in the US. So the types of questions we will be asking there start with simple ones like how is instrumentation organized in the US? How is instrumentation and its community organized in Europe? What are the strengths of the way the US organizes? What are the strengths of the way the international community organizes, particularly, for example, in Europe? And then um, some discussion about how, in each case, we will ask the person, how would you change things if you could? What could be made better, both in Europe, in Asia, and in the United States? And to ask for a distinctive contrast, including the derivative. To what extent is instrumentation today in the US stronger or less strong? And the same in Europe and in Asia. There'll be similar set of questions for quantum sensing, which is forming communities now around the globe, and also for AI and ML. Great, thanks. So um, I, I think it's time for us to pause and take your questions or comments on this part of the uh, of our charge and of our um, you just focus a little bit on on the experiments and and um, what makes a good international partner. Thanks, uh, Dan Acker from Slack uh, and a member of the LZ project. So I appreciate Ian's mentioning this. Um, I, I guess one of the things in the, that maybe it was in the first charge question is what are the barriers? And so, you know, from my own perspective, you know, being part of the LZ project, we now have a understanding with the 
Xenon Mton and Darwin collaborations are current competitors, and we're you know we're teaming up to to, to think about how to do the next generation uh, large xenon observatory for dark matter and so forth. Um, and one of the things that's come up in our early discussions is the very formal project structure in the US and how things are costed with the 413 and so forth. Um, and you know, how do we how do we navigate that? Uh, because it does seem like not an insurmountable barrier, but certainly, you know, a big, a big challenge in terms of you know, the various gates that a US project has to go through um, and how to, how to kind of try to sync within, within those constraints, try to sync our timeline with the timeline of, you know, our colleagues in other countries that have their own challenges for, for phasing and so forth. So um, I guess the question is, you know, what, what do you guys think about, uh, you know how to, how to manage those barriers can they be can they be reduced to be less impeding and I'm happy for a general answer not not specific advice on uh, <laughs> on xenon experiments so you may not know this yet but you're going to be asked these questions or given a chance to say this to the committee directly when you get an invitation to interview to us quite soon <laughs> probably before the end of the weekend but these are indeed deep questions and i think we I think need Marina answers from various experiments and then look at where it has been successfully navigated or ameliorated and where it's become a real roadblock and then what are the causes of that because where there's a will there's always a way and as scientists irrespective of nation we wish to collaborate on great science and so uh, there are challenges also of course in Europe and in Asia just like there are here but we can overcome them but learning how to overcome them partly at least, would be one of the goals of this committee to gather that information and make suggestions for how to overcome them here. Thanks. That was a great question, thank you. That's a, it's a very good question. Um, Marina, I think you were next. Well, I don't know whether this is a question or a comment, but one of the things which has hindered really US uh, collaboration with uh, international partner is the unreliability of our funding support. I mean, uh, the uh, support for specific initiative or a specific manpower is really, really litigated uh, on a yearly basis. And like, for instance, we were just informed at the beginning of this conference that we can expect significant cut even in the manpower, which is actually the thing which in some cases is the best thing that we have to offer to our international partners. And so uh, <clears throat> the second point is that I wanted to resonate with something that Ian said. I just think that the instrumentation community is a good example and should, should broaden, um, should be brought in actually to like the um, general R&D effort. So I think that the promoting partnership between different communities uh, in providing effective leadership also abroad can be very helpful. So I don't know, this is a comment. I hope that it is helpful to you. Great, thank you. I think Yang Ki was next. Thank you. Um, this is perhaps, I don't know, to go to Joanne and, and the other people too. So, so here in the charge, um, the previous P5 already captured some of those main uh, issues to, to be, um, you know, to, for US particle physics. So we want to have a world-class facility for the, the international community at the same time, participating in the, facilities elsewhere and, and workforce and, and others. It's all sort of captured. I think that's why P5 recommended based on that. And uh, so I'm trying to see um, how are we connecting from P5 and we have been following the community and funding agencies have been following that. And, and just, just a little bit of comments and what this could be different. Maybe this is a bit more in depth than, than what P5 has said comments yeah so why don't i start off and then perhaps hand it over to our co-chairs for this one um so first of all this sub panel is an input to the upcoming p5 
And it's a very important piece because as you said, the, the fact that particle physics is a global endeavor is very much the part, right? The, the core tenet of the 2014 landmark uh, P5 report. And I imagine will continue to be so, who knows what the next P5 will do, but I imagine that will continue. Uh, and this sub panel is a very important piece and it is to be more in depth rather than just the global statements, it's what specifically does it take in these three different areas? Let's just take the workforce area. How do you attain and attract uh, a, a world leading workforce here in the US? That type of question in this type of detail, it's not in the P5 charge, but it's extremely important to P5 and to our field. And so that's why this panel will provide the input to P5 that it needs. Wanna add more? Yeah, I guess just to say, it, it, I think of it as we're thinking about the process of how you might best implement a P5 uh, plan uh, and hope that that's what we can, that P5 can work with or uh, will have already done our work so they can hopefully assume that we could accomplish the recommendations we make. Um, so it's more about the, the process for success. Any questions? Yeah, Carsten Heger, Yale. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, undertaking this. I think this will be a really interesting study. You mentioned in your introductory remarks that you're planning to talk to the leaders of the small and big experiments. I was wondering if you also plan to reach out to younger colleagues, postdocs, uh, graduate students, because they might experience different challenges in international collaborations. And in terms of thinking about the future of the field and the vitality of international collaborations, I think it might be important to get their input as well. Carson, thank you for that suggestion. I think we should take it really on, on board and not just count on the leaders of the experiments for, to speak for the uh, younger generation. Yeah, I mean, I've uh, seen it now in recent years in my role as chair many times that the challenges that the younger generation experience doesn't always trickle up uh, to the leadership. And so really knowing for firsthand what they experience as challenges when they work internationally, I think it's important. I wanted to add to that, I absolutely agree. Um, uh, but it is very hard to, oh, sorry. Yeah. Is it on? I absolutely agree. It's also very hard to um, sample from the young people of these various experiments the way that it is from leadership. But luckily, a lot of the experiments have already done that work for us. Um, they've put a, put a lot of work into sort of surveying and gathering input from them. So I hope that maybe we can speak to the people who have done that work who can give us summaries. Dmitry Denisov, BNL. So my, my question was partly stimulated by Andy mentioning Daya Bay and uh, Druna. So, and what's impeding our cooperation in science, yeah, so including with other nations. So, of course, there are some issues in this specific area, sort of which are beyond, I would say, our well, physicists, especially particle physicists. That's sort of what, in many cases, we are told. And my question is sort of how this uh, panel, are you planning to venture into sort of, um, uh, I would say, supporting communication between scientists of different countries and participation independent of, upon of the political climate? I think that's a good question for one of the chairs to answer. I, I agree, that's more question to the chair. Yeah, let so, me so. make sure I understand. Will we venture into how we support communication between physics communities independent of the political climate? Co correct, yeah, look, like participation in, in, in uh, Juno, whatever was certainly contained sort of by the agencies. Yeah, although there was quite a few interested parties on both sides. Yes, I think we will try to um, for sure. Um, how uh, that's sort of a grassroots question, how the community can work to build its own connections, even in the face, one should, could say, maybe that's the way to say it, a political climate. Yes, I think that's a very good point. Thank you. Robin, I think you were. Hi, um, Robin Erbacher. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that uh, having the charge laid out here, um, this is a great idea and I, I really want to, I'm super excited about this panel and I'm glad that HEPAP is doing that. So thank you, um, because I do think it, it's going to be really important. Um, I don't have, uh, I have a lot of gut reactions 
that if I were forced to say, I would, you know, answer some of these questions in my own opinion, but um, it, I think it, it takes a lot of thought um, to come up with something that's universal. And so I look forward to, to thinking about this more. But my question is mostly um, when, when Bonnie told me about the, the title, the benchmarking title, uh, to me, what I, I thought of is how do we compare to other international partners at some level, because then there would be benchmarks. So, in, and then in the charge, I see a lot about how can we, the US do this and that. So I was just wondering whether there is a plan to sort of look at the examples of the inter, inter, other international partners and try to learn from them and, and survey them and see what works for them and what doesn't versus what, what's happening sort of really bench, benchmarking. Um, that I hear you benchmarking is sort of an odd word. And in fact, we come on the heels of the BES report, which is a very, as Joanne mentioned, is a very different report. It's much more about competition and who has the best light source. That's just very different for our field. And the charge was crafted to accommodate that and to think carefully about um, how, frankly, to show our great success in some areas in the field and international collaboration, how we can build on that in other areas. And absolutely, we're trying to reach out to look at how other um, countries successfully internationally collaborate and don't and their practices and things like that. And thank you for the comment. We'll, we'll make sure to do more of it. Baya Papa Dimitriou, Fermilab. I have a comment on the point there uh, how can we sustain our roles and attract the best international partners? So my comment and question is, when we are hosting a facility, how can we involve the international partners on in, in important decisions? For example, we have to delay our schedule. We have to change our scope. We need more money for X and Y. Since we are hosts, sometimes we are taking decisions without necessarily involving the partners in those decisions. How could we work in making this a smoother process so, the, so that the partners are really feeling involved in the government and in the um, in the decision making. So that is a, another great question. Yeah. In some of the interviews that we have already conducted, one of the things that came out from international partners about ways that they found it very positive to collaborate with US-based projects was over the concept of governance and transparency of the collaborations in which they participated. Particle physics in general is a model for the rest of the world in terms of our ability to collaborate. And generally we have very well advanced and thought out structures for governance and for input and excellent codes of conduct. We were one of the first fields to introduce them and we did it some years ago. And people, they say, the ones we've interviewed have said, commented on how that transparency has made them feel that they are truly part of the experiment in the same way as the US-based counterparts. So if that structure though doesn't exist, then it can be challenging. And not every activity that's in our field because the way in which the charge has been defined, we're looking at all of particle physics very broadly interpreted. And there can also be very small experiments in there where the level of governance, the level of detail in the structure of the collaboration generally doesn't get as much attention, often because initially you're beginning with a few people on one side of the ocean and a few people on the other. And that can work when it's just a few people, but it, as it starts to get larger, it, it then begs the question, we need organization, we need governance. And if a smaller experiment doesn't you know, have that, they generally look to bigger ones to learn. And so I think that's very, very important for the for people to be part. 
There's a second part, which is when there are funding issues. They, in my experience, happen everywhere. And an international partner suddenly cannot deliver something. If it's a small, a very small part of the experiment, then the issue is probably smaller and is dealt with in a different way to when it's a big host nation. Because if the host nation can't deliver on a certain point, that affects everybody. And there is, um, in the experiments I'm on, some of which, one of which is based in the US at the moment, there's a model of transparency, which means that whenever there's been a delay in funding, everybody's told about it right away. If that wasn't the case, I think it would be problematic. And so I think we need open sea, openness and transparency. And if you don't have those, then, it's, then it can be difficult for, the, for the, whoever's not the host nation to, to navigate. I hope that answers one yeah. of the features that's come out in some of our interviews. I'd, I'd like to way. add that uh, we routinely ask about the governance and its effects, and the um, responses uh, have varied in you know, how well people think the governance on their experiments works. Some are very positive and some have qualifications. So we're really trying to, you know, and it's a little bit in the spirit of what Robin was asking about before. We're trying to, you know, under, we have our own view, we naturally have our own views on a lot of these um, issues going into the sub panel, but, but we, what we're looking to do is to, um, you know, discuss broadly and, you know, form, form conclusions that we can be confident in are um, correct, not just from our uh, prejudice, so, so to speak. Thanks. Oh, Kevin, I think. Yeah, thank you for all for, for forming this panel and uh, taking this very uh, important thing on. I, you know, somebody who has been a member of a international collaboration that's not based in my host country for, uh, for, for many years, for 17 years now, and then also the previous experiment I was on, even though it was based in the US, you know, had a large number of international partners. I can understand the importance of uh, going through this process and making sure that we're making use of the resources globally in, in an effective way. One of the concerns or also, I don't, maybe I don't quite understand you know, how this panel will go forward is that you know, we, we are also in an era where the projects that we're doing are very big and very large and can take an exceptional amount of time. So if you've looked at some of the projects that are proposed for the high energy frontier, you know, they're 30, 40, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 year projects. And uh, recently in one of the, a Senate hearing uh, a, a few months ago, one a very prominent member of our uh, community got up and, and asked, was asked this question, why aren't some of these experiments in, in the US? And the response was, well, Europe does, the high, does high energy, we do neutrinos was, was the response. And uh, what effect that can have, you know, on future generations of people, early career people who are going to be locked into some of these decisions. So I'm wondering how you can how you're planning to balance the reality of the fact that we do need international collaboration in order to make best use of these resources with also not locking us into decisions that are going to, to you know, be beyond my lifetime you know, um, uh, in, in making some of these choices. For example, we haven't run a high energy ex experiment since the Tevatron in, in 2010, so that's just 12 years ago. Does that mean that we just say, Europe has that and we're not gonna to touch that again. I mean, so what, how are we going to, to tackle those issues? Thanks. So Kevin, those very important issues and questions, and that is something that the upcoming P5 panel will be grappling with. I think that's a little beyond the charge of this current panel, but something that's, so, okay. So I, I, mis I misunderstood the question then, yeah. I guess I'm a little bit confused what exactly this panel does in the process with its input to P5, if not questions like this. Okay, so this panel, um, as in the charge, is set to determine what makes the US a partner of choice, area independent. So it's not a prioritization of areas, but in any and every area, what makes the US a partner of choice for both the areas that we choose to lead here in the US and in areas that we choose to participate in abroad. It's a frontier independent thing. That's the goal. 
Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Hi, yeah, this is uh, Bob Wilson. I work on Dune and SBN, particularly the uh, ICRIS uh, collaboration. Uh, and Fermilab is obviously a very central uh, piece of the US program. So questions about how you know, welcoming we are for participation within the US, uh, a lot of the focus on Fermilab. So I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to give a shout out to Fermilab, you know, Icarus, which is uh, about 50% um, uh, INFN Italy, with, uh, also uh, CERN participation in Mexico and UK, uh, but largely INFN. And uh, as, as you know, the, the history we brought the Icarus detector over to the U US uh, yeah, and were half full when the pandemic hit. Um, so Fermilab uh, bent over backwards to help this collaboration to get um, uh, commission, fill the detector commission, etc. Uh, so we've had very positive experience. Um, the support staff there were you know, terrific. All of this builds uh, tremendous goodwill. Uh, so mostly positive. The more recently, and this is some of it is outside of uh, what Fermilab has direct control over are the new security requirements to get on site. Now it's been convoluted with all of the pandemic restrictions and Fermilab is also very frustrated uh, by this, but it does seem to me that this panel can fold that in and be a voice from the community in an official way that can help Fermilab uh, to make Fermilab be, you know, as welcoming as it's possible to be. Maybe even it can be carved out as a special case within the DOE system, because it is special in hosting this international project. And maybe this, this is a kind of thing that HEPAP uh, can give us a recommendation is to recognize the status as an international lab. And hence, maybe we can get around some of these uh, things which you know, have the lab by the throat and make it difficult for collaborators. Thank you for that. I think we want to take one or two more comments and then we'll move on to the next section. So Tulika. Thanks. Uh, hi, this is uh, Tulika Bose, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, for some of the topics, and just taking a couple of examples, such as attracting the best talent or, or workforce development, there's been a lot of uh, good work that has come out of the, the SNOMAS process over the last uh, couple of years, especially as part of the community engagement uh, frontier. So I was curious, how does this panel interface with that? Are you going to be completely independent to get a different view? Or are you going to synthesize or, you know, and sort of present uh, the work uh, done as part of the snow mass process in a, in a way that, you know, P5 can take? I just wanted to understand the interface here. I, I think, well, in part, we're here so we can hear what the community says on all topics, but including uh, young people and community engagement. So I think we very much will take and learn from the huge body of work that's come out of the whole snow mass process. And if there are other areas we feel like we want to dive deeper into, then we will as well. Thanks. Okay, so Bob, um, did you have a comment? And then we will move on to the accelerator part and then come back to Yeah, this might be too detailed, but with respect to what Bob, Wilson, Bob Bernstein at Fermilab, with respect to what Bob Wilson just said, so Leah, um, I wrote a letter to Leah about this a couple of weeks ago. So the UEC at Fermilab and the lab have formed a committee to look into the campus access issues because you know we built this structure under new DOE regulations that came in during the pandemic, right? And now the whole system is being stress tested. It's breaking all over the place. Um, we know that, we Fermilab know that, um, and we're trying to fix that stuff. But Bob's question actually speaks to a more general issue. It's actually harder to get on site to Brookhaven than it is to Fermilab, um, believe it or not. And so what this panel could do is, you know, not beat up on Fermilab, but talk about, you know, how hard it is to get on these sites because we're fundamentally different from many other places. So that's a place you could be useful, I think. 
Okay, thanks. I think for now I'm going to move Sorry, on, and then uh, we can maybe go. before yeah, please, we move Michelle. to the accelerator program and workforce. I see the hands of my two uh, theory colleagues there, what? and I would like to add to the big experiments and small experiments, uh, instrumentation, quantum, and AI, uh, the theory, um, because I think uh, uh, we theories. Uh, face quite a bit of challenge uh, when we have to collaborate, for example, with uh, uh, Europe or Latin America or other places. And maybe I will give the opportunity maybe to uh, Jesse or, or Shekhar to, to say something about it. I, I would love to hear that. Okay, we can do that now or we can do it later. I, it, let's, let's go ahead and do that now. And um, I don't want to miss the opportunity. Thanks. So Jesse Thaler, MIT. Um, this is building a bit on what Robin was saying before, um, and just kind of understanding the charge. And you know, th this ties into into the theory question, um, but kind of more generally. You know, in the charge, it asks questions like, how can the U.S. build and maintain its reputation as a partner of choice? But not explicitly in the charge is what is CERN doing that is helping build its reputation as a partner of choice? Or in terms of you know, for example, in theory, in terms of recruiting people to come to the U.S., why would they? come to a US university versus going to CERN for a postdoc. And so I think that comparative thing that Robin was getting at, it doesn't seem to be explicitly part of the charge. And I was trying to figure out whether that kind of comparison, comparing other major you know, countries' labs, whether that's gonna be part of the charge or not. I think we've we've discussed it. It's uh, the data collection is a little more complicated when you're going outside the US of getting some, you know, Data, but in terms of interviewing people, maybe interviewing some of the the, the um, early career may actually give us some insight into um, how how that's working and, and where we can do better. Jesse, I think the um, I think that comparison you're asking for is implicit in the title benchmarking, which is what Rob was getting at. It's implicit in the title, but I was but it's not in, it's not in the charge. Yeah, but the charge doesn't forbid doesn't forbid comparing and contrasting. I think that's the natural way to approach these questions. Right. I mean, I, mean, I think this is maybe a, a semantic issue. I don't think the word benchmark even appears in the charge itself. No, I think you're right. It doesn't. And so, so I guess what I'm worried is that this is an inward. I, I don't want it to be just an inward facing activity where we're pulling our community. No. Yeah. Okay. So I want so, it to be more of, hey, look, if there's these other places, what are they doing? What type of opportunities are they setting up? You know, and you know, specifically, if I'm just taking the example of theory and postdocs, a competitive advantage that the US has for attracting talent is the time scale that we have for our postdoctoral positions, which are typically three years compared to Europe, which is two or two plus one. And so that's an example where actually we're doing a good thing in terms of longer time scales. So that's, a, that's an advantage that we have. I wanna highlight things like that, but also then there's things that we're not doing quite as well. But that comparison, I think, is, is, is quite useful, even though I, I totally agree that we're in this environment where we want to collaborate. Uh, but understanding how we can be a better partner or attract people, I think it needs to be in comparison to what other people are doing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just a sacred um, uh just to, to build on what Jesse was saying and also Robin before her, uh, him. Um, I'm a little confused when I read the charge, you know, when we talk about the talent ecosystem for high energy physics in the United States, that's actually predominantly universities. So a lot of what needs to happen is understanding the university ecosystem as well and how the university ecosystem is or isn't being well supported through uh, programs in high energy physics. And I'm, maybe I, I apologize, I was a little late. Maybe I missed how that was going to be incorporated into your, uh, into your studies or how, how you're going to address that. I, thank you for the comment. I absolutely, well, I'm from a university, so I agree. It's very important. Um, and uh, we, we will move on to accelerators and then hear from workforce. And then you might hear us talk a little bit more about really thinking through with respect to workforce, both of the issues I think you just raised and in general research support at universities. And we'll consider both that and of course the laboratories. Joanne. Just one quick thing before we move on. Uh, just a very friendly, gentle reminder to everyone in the audience, if you're not speaking, to please wear your mask. Thank you. 
Okay, so um, let's change gears a little bit and let's move on to the accelerator part. I think you need a microphone. What do you, yeah, Joanne? We'll talk a little bit about what's, what's the same and what's different about international partnerships there. So uh, yeah, my name is Mei Bai. So I'm the uh, chairing the subcommittee of Accelerator. A lot of things have been already talked about. Don't feel much to add. Uh, the, there are common, a lot of common things between accelerator uh, particle physics at large. Uh, in particular, our subcommittee have been thinking, how do we look at our uh, community accelerator as a whole, compare what we have now and compare how we match with the particle physics, this global endeavor. How do we match your needs? Because we are here to make sure your science to be successful in, doesn't matter where to host in the whole global environment. We do have some successful stories. For instance, the LARP was very successful and ongoing the support of Hilumi RHC. Uh, US play a very important role. I think so 50% of that was by US or close to 50%. My number has to be cross-checked. And question is how do we go forward? Right uh, now, Europe is taking the energy frontier. A lot of very active as a whole. Europe, Asia. This morning, the AF3 session has shown the Chinese part uh, has been far ahead of us. They've been prototyping various uh, uh, key elements. So, how do we uh, see ourselves? Uh, so, our plan is to the same thing as uh, following the example of. Uh, Andy and Ian already said a lot of similar questions, but for us specifically, uh, we would like to understand from the community, both the funding agency, uh, our international collaborators, and the lead PIs in the community uh, to see the portfolio of the accelerator R&D technology, including in industrial partners. So for instance, suppose, uh, lock on wood, and we all celebrate tomorrow. ILC Japanese government say yes, let's go. We all jump on it, Joanne, right? Well, <laughs> but then uh, we U.S. as the partner, a significant part, are we ready? Accelerator colleagues, are we ready together with our industry, industrial partners, to provide, for instance, SRF cavity uh, for the uh, ILC? Are we ready? So, and uh, in also echo on some of this brought up the benchmarking uh, comparison. One of the questions we would like to understand from our colleagues in the field is how I would like to understand how do they feel they're supported, their activity supported? The, do they feel they're well supported, they're fair supported, or they're poorly supported? Especially want to compare with their partners the partners, collaborators, competitors in the in today's environment is all the same. We're uh, very constructively uh, competitive in in the science in the science uh, world. So these are things we would like to get out. And uh, in terms of the workforce, everybody feel we do the same. We're not different. And if you have attended AF1 discussion on Thursday, it has been crying out loud that we have problems to attract top-notch students to come to accelerator field. So if we don't build a collider tomorrow, how do we make sure we have a really, uh, I, I'm probably not gonna be here, but the, the torch, the baton has to be passed down. So these are common uh, things. Thanks. Are there any comments on this? Um, maybe, uh, oh, please. Great. Uh, thank you, man, and to the panel. Um, so I think, uh, as you said, this is a HEP activity that, that in some sense, right, is, is inspired by or, uh, you know, coming out of also the BES parallel activity. So. 
um, in accelerators in particular, but I also think in many of the other areas that you identify, quantum, AI, ML, uh, certainly, and perhaps detectors. There are also interlinkages with other areas of, of the Office of Science, of NSF, and, and other areas, right? So, uh, you know, one potential answer to your question, May, about, you know, how do we attract people to accelerator science, right, in the absence of building a collider, would be uh, other types of accelerators, light sources, uh, things of this nature, right? Um, so I want to solicit your and the, and the panel's thoughts on, you know, how you view that interlinkage between this panel, HEP, and other areas of science. Thanks. Um, that's a very good point. And that's part of the things we would like to also jointly with the uh, with colleagues in the field to understand this uh, funding structure. We're we're special. Uh, we're not special. We're, we have our own funding structure in compar comparison study. How is this done in Eurasia? Maybe co comment on the previous speaker. Yeah, so we are building collider. We are building electron ion collider. So it's maybe not high energy physics collider, but it's a, where is a place where we don't have any issues of bringing like young accelerator and other scientists to come and join because it's very exciting project. So it's probably a lesson for our field as well. Very good input. Yeah, thank. There is another collider building in the globe as well. So forgive me, it's been such a crazy year if I've totally missed this, <laughs> but this is the first time I had heard about this and this sounds really interesting and I looked at the charge letter, it's, uh, which said the report was supposed to be due in July, but it sounds like this is getting started. So again, if I'm just ignorant, forgive the question. <laughs> Is it something, or I guess, what's the time frame, and what are the mechanisms for us to, in a thoughtful way, provide input to the various subcommittees on this panel? Will there be workshops, a written document? How can we think about this and get you guys the information you need to come up with this report? What's the time scale and the mechanism? So the time scale is for the fall, and the fall is kind of loosely defined, but um, it's at least the end of October. So um, the the getting input into us before September would be most helpful. Um, you can at this point we we you could send email to the, to us the chair, to Bonnie or myself or to to anyone on the on the panel that you see here or or. or you had read about. There's a Google Doc that uh, linked to the agenda today. So if you have a comment that you want to make, you know, it, this week, you can also add something there. Um, it, we 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 may have a more formal way of getting input once we get the technology um, put together. We're sort of on a fast timeline, so um, we'd like to get this uh, report finished before the P5 process really gets going. I add a little, um, yeah. uh, Patty saying, uh, uh, Mark, for accelerator side, we uh, just started, we're a little behind uh, the other three subcommittees. We just started uh, putting together the interview. So um, you are actually on the list. You have not been bothered because of the snow mass. So thank you all. And just maybe as one final follow-up point, I think is because as we've heard, uh, the, the time scale for uh, these colliders rapidly out, it, it's much beyond that of a postdoc or other things. And I think people vote with their feet and the opportunity. And I think that is one thing where the accelerator R&D, if we give people a chance to do R&D, even if they're not going to realize the collider on the time scale of a postdoc, but if you give them opportunities through exciting facilities, uh, there's many places where we can make it attractive for people to come and do research here. Sorry, Mark, was the acoustic was not very uh, clear. Are you, I just. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I just tried to repeat that you mentioned about a uh, accelerated R&D to how do we find a chance to make sure everybody's enabled? Is that what you're. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, that's exactly what we would like to understand how we are matched with the resources we have so far. And as a comparison, the other things, uh, international, right? The accelerator is also part of an international. Europe has uh, FCCEE, 
how do we participate, how do we contribute uh, that as well. So this is uh, something we have on the agenda. Okay, thanks. I think we're gonna go to um, the last um, subcommittee. So Sakazi, you're online and can you- uh, and Yes, maybe I'm here. About what you're can I share? Can, can I share my screen, please? Um, yeah, you should be able to. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so the panel that the, 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 the subcommittee that I'm chairing has to do with, um, with workforce issues. And this panel is composed of the people who are enumerated here, um, many of whom I'm sure you, you, you know them. Um, what we're trying to do first is to collect as much data as possible. And so we've sent out uh, a request to various institutions, um, laboratories to supply the data for the years 2019 through 21. Um, and, and some of these laboratories, for instance, Brookhaven does more than HEP. So we want to make it clear that we're only interested in HEP. Um, and we're also reaching out uh, to international facilities and institutions as well. So DAISY, we've requested. So some of the data we're trying to get a handle on, um, for instance, the number of research scientists and postdocs, engineers, technicians, um, break, broken down into categories, women, men, other gender, underrepresented groups. Um, and uh, we've enumerated the underrepresented groups for the US, so it wouldn't apply, of course, to DAISY. Um, but to Fermilab, Brookhaven, and so forth in the US. And we also like to get some handle on the number of foreign born members of the research staff, if that's possible. Um, we'd also like to get the uh, data on the number of internships uh, and salaried students. And we don't really want to differentiate between these two. Um, originally, um, I sent an email out asking for internships, and then there was some question, do we include salaried students? So that's not so important. You know, Some students are part of something like the SULI program. Um, others are hired directly, but we want to just get the number of students who are based in doing research at the lab at both the undergraduate and graduate level. We'd like to know the number of faculty that are spending uh, visitorships or you know, ongoing work on collaborations at the facilities. Um, we'd also like to find out the number of PhDs that students received um, who are based at the laboratory. Um, and then the final question, which, which, which sort of reflects on what was stated um, earlier about uh, whether or not we've given up the energy frontier or not. This is sort of a blue sky question. Um, if given the go ahead to construct a say 50 TeV proton proton collider, roughly how many more scientists, engineers, technicians would the lab need to hire? And of course, you know, some of the response, oh, that's, so, that, that's very difficult to see. And, and that's true. I mean, it, it, it's really, um, you know, just make the best guess that you can. Um, and as um, was said earlier, the charge of this committee is not to propose this type of facility, but it is fair for us to just say, you know, what would it take if P5, for instance, were to push the idea and DOE says, hey, well, let's do that. You know, what would it take in terms of workforce? So those are some of the laboratories. Um, hmm, why am I not going to the next? Hold on a second. Maybe click on the, the slide. On escape. Oh, shoot. Oh, okay, great, okay. Okay, so um, we are also requesting data from the collaborations. And so we're requesting data from Atlas CMS, um, from Dune. And for those, we want to get uh, information on the number of researchers by, uh, by gender. Um, again, undergraduate and graduate students and also faculty. And then finally, to try to get uh, sort of a general idea for the whole US, for instance, or the whole UK in comparison, 
Um, you know, what is the size of the of the HEP workforce, um, namely the number of women, men, etc., cetera, um, and also foreign born. Now the foreign born might be a little, a little tricky. Uh, IOP said it doesn't track that, but you know, we're just asking people to do the best that they can. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. That's uh, the end of the slides and I'll stop there and take any questions. Okay, so let's, great, thanks. Um, let's start with Yankee and then we'll walk. Yeah. Thank you very much. You are already have a lot of work uh, or preparing for collecting data. And certainly, I think the diversity focus is uh, incredibly important. And thank you for doing that. Um, I'd like to have uh, the another sort of uh, the focus, which is uh, how to bring the brightest minds from outside to U.S. So this is a much beyond the particle physics topic, as you know. Uh, yeah. This is a big, uh, much bigger issue. So that might be some society, i.e. American Physics Society or AIP, and might have some more uh, the statistics. If you do stat the, uh, any data of a scientist who are born, that's a bit too old. We have to really look at what's going on this year and last year, how many students are coming in. Uh, we have a much bigger issue, uh, and, and uh, I'd, I'd like to make sure that we uh, pay attention to that aspect as well. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, one of the things that we want to do once we get this data, and I may have forgotten to mention that we want to get it by the end of July. So we're talking. And we, we asked for the data about two weeks ago, right? So we're hoping to get it by the end of ju July. And we need to process that data, look at it. Uh, the committee, subcommittee will discuss it. And then we will reach out to the broader community. And then we will bring in such things as your question about how to attract and retain the brightest. And um, that's also basically part of the charge as, uh, as was stated earlier. So that's sort of a stage number two. But the first thing we have to do is just try to fan out, you know, I mean, we, we may be doing great already, I don't know. I mean, I, I, although I suspect that we are not, but um, let's get the data, process it, reach out to the community and go from there. Yeah, I think if you have um, statistics of some, um, you know, where the, like the AAP has a particular statistic that would be helpful for us, but if you would just send us an email or uh, let us know. Right. Because we, we have time to look, but not an intimate amount, an infinite amount of time. Right, okay. absolutely. Uh, yeah. Over, over here. here Thank you. Maria Elena Monzani, Slack. I have five comments on barriers for recruiting and retaining people. Three of the international contexts, one at home and one in between. I'm going to write them down also because I know I speak very fast with an accent. First thing, um, DOE and NSF have a number of traineeship and scholarship that are restricted to US citizens. And half of our students or a third of our students are not US citizens. And this makes it harder to train people, especially some of the traineeship target underserved communities. And in California, people from underserved communities tend to be born outside of the United States, out of the border. So this is something that the um, Office of Science can change and we should let them know. Second one is sensitive countries. There are five countries that produce, some of them produce physicists. They go to graduate school in America. They're not allowed to access the DOE complex. They're not allowed to get an account on the computing facilities. So we've had students try to join our collaboration and we had to tell them, go be a theorist because you cannot be a particle physicist in America. Number three, during COVID, international travel was blocked for everybody. And then for visa holders, they reopened travel about a year after they reopened it for citizens. And we lost several people who said, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna not see my family for three years. They quit their job or got jobs in Europe. That's more than one case. So this is for the international thing. National thing, uh, this conference has a lot of accessibility things and we made a point of making them very visible. I drift around with my table. We had an AS ASL interpreter, we have captioning. The DOE complex is not ADA compliant. Basically they say, because you need a badge, this is not a public site. We don't have pro to provide accessibility. At Slack, I can go to my office. I cannot go to my lab. I'd like to say that this 
this is bad for the field that I cannot go to my lab. I cannot go check in on my students or postdocs, whatever they're doing in the lab. I do mostly computing, but still. And the last one is about um, people with dual uh, physics and computing background with having enormous retention challenges because these people make three times more money, five times more money outside of physics. And there is a cultural barrier, which is physicists who build hardware are, are counted as physicists. P physicists who build software, they are counted as, oh, you're a weird technical person, you're not a leader in the field. And this happens to me, happens to everybody I know. So I think we need a cultural change because we are not able to hold on to these people. We spend a year training them and they leave after six months and go to industry because they don't have the, record, the, the recognition in, in their career. And attached to that, there may be a need for a career path for people with dual backgrounds, joint appointments with data science, joint appointments with universities, specific career paths that, you know, I was hired as luck as engineering physicist, then that went away, then they want to make a new one. There hasn't been a consistent way to um, recruit and provide career paths with, for people with computing backgrounds. And I'm going to write this down because I know it's a lot. Right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that was an excellent, excellent uh, comment. So please write it down. And it would be good for you and I to chat offline as well over the coming days. Great, thank you, Manachi. Okay, yeah. Um, so I have a comment that in your data collection, you may want to also include postdocs and research scientists and compare it internationally because one of the things which we are not good at in USHEP is maintaining a, a healthy pool of research scientists and they sort of leave the field mostly. Um, but our international partners uh, groups have many uh, such uh, people at that level. And so there is an issue of competitiveness, uh, which builds up and also mentorship. Uh, that's one thing. And- um, But we did, we, we are including postdocs among the research staff. Research, the research... They're talking about more senior positions as research scientists. Research scientists, that is luck, you know. We oh, 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 yeah, 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 okay, okay. But I didn't see postdocs in the university list of yours. Maybe that's missing. You said under. No, no, not postdocs in universities, but the, at the laboratories. The universities, no, are just... universities should be included in this, right? Yep. You have. Ooh, that, that, yeah. to, to universities get, are a big part of the USHEP workforce. Yeah, yeah. The only way we're trying to capture nationally is through the AIP statistics. But for me to try to grab data from universities all across the country in such a short period of time, I think would be a bit. Uh, well, a if you are asking for data from from CMS and Atlas and other places that already captures a huge amount of- Yeah, of yeah. Tova, do you position. want to comment? Uh, you know, uh, I, pardon? To I was asking Tova if she wanted to comment on, she was nodding. <laughs> no, it is awkward. It's awkward, obviously. What you're saying is that um, we haven't separated universities because we can't ask every university for their data, but we are going to look at Atlas and CMS data, and then we have that information within those experiments. So we just aren't, there isn't a specific separate category for universities because of the data collection challenge. And Dune, right? They are, you, we should really take the large experiments and, and as to capture yeah. most of it. Yeah. The, um, yeah. the other point I wanted to make was also university-based scientists, uh, uh, engineers, because that was also not part of it. There is a technical workforce at the universities, and yes, yeah. you may need Thanks. to do some extra work for capturing that. But over time in USHEP, this has gone down. And if we want to, again, compete with our international partners, we need to reinforce that. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank Great, you. thank you. Here, there's a comment here. Just, just super quickly, um, you know, as the institutional board chair for US Atlas, uh, feel free to send us uh, requests and we will do everything that we can to uh, answer them. Great, Great, thank you. Thank, thank you. Steve Gottlieb, Indiana University. I read the charge before I arrived here and I was heartened to see that among the key technologies mentioned were particle accelerators, detectors and high performance computing, which of course is an interest of mine. I'm not sure exactly how that's uh, reflected in your committee structure, which mentions uh, quantum, which is not high performance computing at this time. 
and uh, machine learning and AI, neither of which are mentioned in the charge to charge letter. So I'm concerned about your lack of con concern with high performance computing. All right. Thank you for the comment. Uh, AI uh, and ML uh, is uh, in our uh, subcommittee structure. So that's a, the, uh, that's us going outside of the charge where we think is relevant and, and we can do so too for high performance computing in general. Yeah, I think that it was something that it's a good that you brought it up as I think it's an important part of, of talking about the future and and I and I think we have to find a way to incorporate it. So yep. your input would be really helpful. Oh, there's Harvey too. When I read the charge, uh, it struck me that a lot of the uh, answers go back to macroscopic questions. So for example, when talking about what makes the US a partner of choice, I thought about the university system. Uh, these are some of the strongest elements that we have. Similarly, it's a thread because when you think about workforce, I would again talk about the onboarding of people into our community through the university system. And although it doesn't relate to the specific questions which are posed within high physics, it is one of the greatest strengths. And for example, the best graduate students are evaluated among other things on the basis of the research they've done as undergraduates and the best ones have already sampled multiple disciplines. So I think that uh, whether or not it's in the charge that those, that kind of thread should, I felt should be present in the response. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, Jim Brow, University of Oregon. Um, regarding your question on the 50 TV collider, I had a couple of uh, follow-ups on that. One was I can imagine, I gather you're asking each of the labs to specify how much workforce improve, increase they need. Um, that would definitely depend on the scope that they take on and would, will you be asking for an estimate of the scope that goes along with that workforce <laughs> No, we're not really getting into too many details on that one because well, they um, they, they're, push, they're pushing back on that question because it's such a huge one. <laughs> so it would be nice to just get some idea. Okay. So, then, maybe, so maybe my colleague there from Brookhaven can, can think, what would it take to, to bring such a collider to Brookhaven? So you're asking them each one to estimate the entire workforce? Each one. Yeah, each one given its workforce, what it would take yes, at that, that lab that, to do. That's why I asked about the scope. Anyway, um, yeah. then the second the second part is that the community is actually uh, aspiring to uh, work on a Higgs factory before we get to the 50 TV range. And so I'm wondering, are you asking a similar question or do we already know we have a sufficient workforce? No, 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 not that, no. It, it, you know, I think those questions are, as was said earlier, sort of out of the scope of this particular uh, 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 um, panel. And so the only, the only idea here is to just get some idea for one, one such device. We could have picked the Higgs or whatever, but um, we picked the PP. I mean, it's, it's not something that we want to look Rather at all possible. something this next couple of decades, you chose five decades instead, okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, the idea is to get back on the energy frontier. I think we have time for one more question or comment. They would like to take the room and get ready for the next session. Is there any final and key? First of all, before we end, I, I really would like to thank all of you. This is a, a very important panel and uh, we should all trying to provide all the information you already saw people you know dedicated to provide your, your information so I, I think it'd be such a critical important one so i'd like to thank everybody so we are talking about benchmarking and, and data i'm also quite interested in uh, see how we do compare to other successful you know regions or countries about balancing meaning that experimentalists overall instrumentation people, accelerator people, computing people. So some sort of a kind of a, you know, this balance among different, this expertise, that might be uh, something very crucial. I know for sure accelerator versus <laughs> the experimental part of the the ratio, probably US is one of uh, perhaps really issue, uh, the problematic area. 
but that kind of information doesn't have to be very detailed, but some high level, some comparison might be quite uh, helpful. That, that, that's a nice idea. So I wanna thank you all for coming today. Um, you brought up a lot of good questions. There's some things we haven't, uh, we haven't discussed. And I think that gives us a little more homework and a little more context of how we can um, shape this report and make it useful for the community and, and a useful uh, input into, into the P5 process. I think we all are, are so accustomed to the fact that our field is international. We grew up in an international field. I think we also, it's an opportunity for us to explain to the, um, the, the, the agencies and to, to Congress about how, how this works and how it has worked well and how we, we can make it work even better in the future. So thanks. Thank you. And I want to thank the panelists for coming and for volunteering their time to help us with this. And I want to give them a big round of applause too. And a couple of them that are online. I think Stefan and Sakazi. Yeah, what, what is the size, just out of curiosity, what is the size of the audience there, roughly in person? 50, 50, 50, a little more than 50, maybe. 75. Oh, great, Fant fabulous, fabulous. Thank you.